So welcome everyone to CS251. Um, I'm really glad that you're taking the uh, course this semester and I really look forward to meeting you all throughout the uh, semester. Um, so yeah, let's get uh, started uh, here with the first lecture. Okay, so this will be an introduction to the course. So I'm going to try to uh, set the right context for the uh, course in this lecture and also actually in the next lecture. So we're going to have a lecture on uh, Wednesday night as well. Um, uh, which will be in some sense part two of the introduction uh, to the course uh, and then um, maybe in some sense the main technical content we're going to start uh, on uh, Thursday morning okay so let's start with the uh, I guess the most uh, basic question here which is you know what is theoretical computer science right and um, before we answer we can answer that question we should ask a more basic question uh, that is what is uh, computer science and then we should ask like what does the word theoretical add here and so I want to ask you actually what is computer science uh, get your opinion on this is it a branch of do you think a science is the branch of engineering is the branch of mathematics is the branch of philosophy or is the branch of uh, sports I guess uh, Given the recent events, this picture here might spark some interesting conversation in the chat. Um, but yeah, by the way, feel free to, you know, use the chat freely. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask your questions there. So now I'm going to start the poll. Um, so you should be now able to um, see at itempool.com CS251 uh, slash live and uh, vote here of course you can vote for more than one option but i'm just interested in seeing kind of the distribution here uh for the uh answers art yes it's also i think definitely art but i would say math is art so maybe science is art engineering is art so yes the <laughs> we have 251, exactly, 251 votes uh, for uh, math. What are the odds of that? Um, and then uh, A is science, 194, B, uh, 166 uh, for engineering, and uh, 100 for philosophy, 102. And this is, I like to see this because you can see that, you know, all the options basically got a lot of votes. And I totally actually agree with that, right? I think that is the, um, in some sense, the right perspective is that computer science is related to all these uh, areas. And my favorite quote basically uh, of all time and the motivational quote for the course is the following. Computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Okay, so now, you know, this raises the question, if computer science is not really about computers, then what is it about? If it's not about our laptops, our phones, our tablets, what is it really about? So I want to basically answer that question now. And to do that, what I'm going to do is actually uh, do a comparison between physics and computer science and try to understand the role of theoretical physics within physics and how that compares to the role of theoretical computer science within computer science. And I think this analogy is going to help us understand uh, computer science a bit better because I feel like we maybe have a better intuition perhaps of what physics studies and what the role of theoretical physics is within physics. Okay, so let's start with physics. I'm going to divide physics roughly into three main parts. Okay, so there's the theoretical physics sides, a side of it, experimental physics, and the applications engineering uh, side of physics. So starting with theoretical physics, what does a theoretical physicist do? Okay, so you observe some phenomenon. So maybe you see an apple fall down on the ground, or you look at the sky and you see planet starts, stars moving around. And you want to now understand why and how those things are happening, right? Okay, then what is our best method for understanding, creating reliable explanations? Well, it turns out our best method is to come up with a mathematical model that captures the behavior of uh, what you're observing. Now, this is interesting, right? So why a mathematical model? You know, in, some people say like nature's language uh, is mathematics. 
Einstein has a very famous quote here. He says, uh, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is the fact that it is comprehensible. Okay, and what he means by this is basically, it is surprising that uh, our elegant mathematical theories are extremely successful at explaining the universe. Now, it didn't have to be that way, right? Um, this is a kind of a mysterious relationship. It could have been like, you know, it's like an onion with thousands of layers. Maybe the universe behavior is like a collection of random looking thousands of rules. It's not like that. It is really seems to be governed by elegant mathematical theory. So this is what we mean by nature's language uh, is mathematics. Okay, so now you have a mathematical model. Then what do we do? Well, now that we have a mathematical model, we can study it rigorously, logically, and derive the logical consequences of the model, and then create a new knowledge, new understanding uh, using the model, right? So this is really how theoretical physics in some sense works. Here are some pictures of famous theoretical physicists, and they spend a lot of time, as you can see, in front of the board. Okay, so now let's go to experimental physics. Now, experimental physicists will make observations about the universe, right? So they will have often nowadays complicated equipment to be able to, you know, um, see things or observe things that are really, really far away, observe things that are really, really tiny, like electrons, photons, observe things uh, that are at a very high energy, high velocity, and so on. And of course, these observations are very important and we'd, we would like to uh, understand and explain those observations. And importantly, they also test the mathematical models of the theoretical physicists, right? And this is a very important uh, part of, uh, you know, the, the scientific uh, method. Uh, if your model does not e agree with experimental results, you know, it doesn't matter how elegant it is. It doesn't matter how much time you spent on, you know, coming up with the model. It's just wrong, right? So we have to either completely come up with a new model or make modifications to the model, right? If it does not agree with experiment, then um, it's not correct. Okay, and then there's the applications engineering side of physics. Of course, we want to use, make use of our new understanding of the universe uh, to make our lives better in some sense, right? So that's in some sense the applications engineering side of physics. Now here's a nice diagram illustrating all of this uh, and highlights the role of theoretical physics within physics. So we have on the one side uh, the real world, on the other side the abstract mathematical world. In the real world we observe uh, something and we want to explain it, we want to understand it better. So we create a mathematical uh, model uh, that hopefully captures the behavior of what we're seeing what we're observing. Now that we have a mathematical model, we can use logical reasoning to uh, derive you know, all the logical consequences and create new knowledge. Uh, and then once we have that, we can now come back to the real world in a couple of different ways. One is to test, of course, our model and see hopefully um, the predictions that our model makes, the new knowledge that we predict hopefully matches reality, that's the testing phase, and then also uh, we want to create applications, right? So this is the engineering uh, application side of things. Okay, so this is an overall picture of physics, and this, you know, method of creating new knowledge, understanding the world, is extremely successful. As one example, consider Einstein's theory of general relativity, right? It's extremely uh, good at explaining the behavior of very large particles um, like you know planets and stars and explaining gravity. Uh, on the other hand we have uh, quantum physics which is extremely successful at explaining the behavior of very tiny particles like electrons and photons. Quantum physics makes stupefyingly accurate predictions about the behavior of these particles so it's like one of the most celebrated um, you know scientific theories out there. Okay, so this has been uh, extremely important and, you know, general theory of relativity and quantum physics has completely revolutionized our understanding of the universe. Okay, so now if I ask you, you know, with respect to physics, you know, is it a branch of science or related to science? 
you know, of course, right? So if you think that, you know, physics is not science, you know, what kind of definition of science you're using, I don't know. Um, is it related to engineering? Yes. So the application side, uh, you can say, is, you know, related to engineering. Is it related to mathematics? Yes, you know, we build mathematical models to really understand uh, nature. Um, is it related to philosophy? Of course, right? Some of the deepest philosophical questions that we might ask, like, I don't know, um, can something come from nothing? Or, you know, what is consciousness? And things like that. You know, I think this is in the territory of physics, and I think physicists would love to answer these kinds of questions, right? Okay, so uh, that's physics. Okay, so now we come to computer science. Now, if I wanted to, you know, tell you what computer science is using the least number of words possible, I would probably say like it's the science that studies computation. But then, you know, this would be kind of cheating because, you know, what is computation? I have to explain that to you. And computation is basically manipulation of information or data. Okay, so this is the most general definition of uh, computation, uh, I think. And this is the, you know, the right perspective. Now, usually, um, we have the thing that does the manipulation of information, we're going to call it a computer. Usually, there's some input information that goes into the computer, the computer manipulates that information and then produces output information, right? Now, this manipulation of information can sound a bit vague at first. So I think one you know, thing that can help in you know, understanding what this means is to think about calculation. Now, what, what is calculation? Calculation is manipulation of numbers, right? So when you're calculating, you're manipulating numbers. And you can think of computation, basically, um, generalization of calculation. You're not restricted to just numbers now as information, but you can deal with other kinds of information. Maybe you can deal with like audio or video or text or other things, right? So in that sense, like computation is generalization of calculation. At the same time, I should say like that distinction actually is kind of artificial because um, really, you can represent anything, you can encode anything with numbers. So really, computation is the same as calculation. But, you know, for now, you know, at the high level, uh, this is a good way to think about it. Okay, so now there's um, another, you know, key word uh, that people will use a lot in this context, right? So the concept of an algorithm. An algorithm is a precise description, usually like a step-by-step -step, uh, description of how the data is manipulated by the computer, okay? Now, when we use the word computer, it, we usually mean like a physical instantiation, like a physical device. And you can think of the algorithm as the uh, specification of the computer. It's kind of like a text representation uh, of uh, the physical device of the computer. Though in this course, really, for us, algorithm and computer, they're going to be uh, really synonyms. We're not going to be really interested in the physical uh, realizations, implementations of these things, but keep it uh, sort of in the mathematical um, uh, world. Okay, so then another uh, important uh, keyword here is computational problem. Okay, so this represents the, uh, the input-output pairs uh, that you're interested in solving in some sense, right? So think about, for example, the multiplication problem. The multiplication problem, the input is maybe a couple of numbers and the output is the product of those numbers, okay? So that would be one computational problem. Now, if you have a computer whose input-output behavior matches the computational problem matches, let's say, the multiplication problem, then we will say that the computer solves that computational problem, okay? So uh, that's the uh, sort of notion of computational problem. Okay, so now let's maybe give some examples, right? So we've talked about this at a very high level. So one example is like a calculator, right? So you can say, okay, I have a calculator, I can punch in like five times two equals, and then, you know, something happens inside the calculator and you see the number 10 appear on the screen. And so that's the output. Now, it's interesting to think about like what happens inside the calculator that produces that output. Because, because it's not like, you know, all there's like a huge multiplication table 
um, which is hard coded into the calculator, and then the calculator just fetches the right number from that table. No, right? So there is actually some kind of an algorithm that runs within the calculator that does that computation for you to produce the correct output. Okay. Now, other obvious examples are like, you know, laptops uh, and your phones and so on. But let's make it more interesting, right? So let me ask you now, do you think like a human being is in some sense a computer or does computation? Okay, so what do you think? Let me know in the chat, um, yes or no. Uh, if you say yes, why yes? If you say no, why do you feel like maybe humans um, should not be characterized as computers or doing computation? So some of the, you know, objections might be, right, we don't maybe always give the correct answer or we don't always give consistent answers. Um, right, so these are actually, you know, valid responses. Um, on the other hand, of course, you know, there is a notion of randomized computation. There's a notion of non-deterministic computation. Um, so we're not, you know, restricted when we talk about computation to just like deterministic computation. Uh, computers, you can say, also can make mistakes. You know, algorithms can be buggy. So um, you have all these things. So my perspective, I agree with most of you here, is that, yes, human beings um, do computation all the time, right? So we get input through our five senses, our brains process that information, and then produce output information that might result in muscle movement, um, you know, me speaking, but actually like most of the output information you're not even conscious of, right? So there's a lot of internal things going on in your body and you don't, you're not even aware, uh, aware of these things, right? So absolutely humans uh, do computation. And in fact, if you look at the dictionary, uh, look uh, at the word computer at, in the dictionary, you'll probably find two definitions, right? One describes electronic devices that we uh, use today. The other definition is a human being trained in doing calculation, okay? Because before we have these, we had these electronic devices, a computer really referred to a human being, a person uh, trained in doing calculation. So here are some computers um, from the early 20th century. This is like uh, Alan Turing's uh, time. So what do you see, what do you notice about these pictures? What do you notice about the computers at the before uh, electronic computers? Yeah, they're basically all women. You're right. Um, the reason for this was, unfortunately, these were like uncivilized times and you could pay women less uh, to do uh, this uh, job. Um, and yeah, I mean, we sort of still live in uncivilized times, but, you know, at the time it was uh, sort of... Um, you know, maybe you could say much worse and much more obvious. Um, okay, so let's come back here. One more example, one more question for you. How about like biological evolution? Do you think biological evolution is computation? If, it, if you think yes, what is the data being manipulated? If you think no, why do you think no? Yeah, so genes, right? Um, if Genes are very interesting, actually, in a couple of different ways. One is like, you can say like genes, in some sense, your genes is like a, a code, genetic code is like a program that produces you, right? A human being. And in that sense, that is computation itself. On the other hand, that's not really what I'm asking here. I'm, when I'm talking about biological evolution, I'm really looking at how does that genetic code, how does that program information evolve over time from species to species. And you can see that as computation because the information here there is evolving uh, over time. And you can look at that um, uh, process from the computational perspective, which brings me to uh, the, the computational lens, which is that, you know, this is one of the things that I really love about computer science. It's really related to many, many different areas, many different fields. Take your favorite area, okay? Physics, biology, chemistry, economics, finance, linguistics. Put the word computational in front of it, 
And this will be actually a legitimate field that people work in and study, right? So this is the computational lens. You can apply the computational lens to pretty much uh, anything because computation is a very general uh, phenomenon. And this is one of the things that I really love about computer science because, you know, you don't have, computer science is a large field. You don't have to like, you know, everything about computer science, but it's hard not to find something within computer science that really is interesting to you. Okay. Now, let me say that, you know, this is the computational lens is an additional perspective in your study, right? So uh, it's not, I don't mean to say that this is the only important aspect of your study, but it's an aspect, it's a uh, perspective that you should, I think, add uh, to your study. And also, you know, the computational perspective um, does not have to be useful always. Like, you know, if I have, I don't know, some rock sitting on my desk, um, I can say, well, it's not doing anything. It's mapping zero to zero, one to one. So it's identity map or something, you know, that's not interesting or that's not useful in my uh, understanding of things. So I don't, I don't mean to say computational perspective is always going to give you useful things, but it is a perspective uh, to keep in mind. Now, that being said, I want you to keep two things in mind from this discussion. Okay. One is look, you know, our brains are computers, uh, does computation. Whenever we're trying to understand the world, whenever we're trying to create new knowledge, whenever we're trying to um, discover new things, new technologies, this is computation. This is computation happening in individual brains, and it's computation happening in, uh, in some sense, a network of brains, right? So you don't really, you know, do... Um, you know, discover new things in a vacuum. Uh, you build on other people's work, other people's discoveries and knowledge, and you also collaborate with other people. Okay? So, you know, whether you're trying to understand fundamental laws of physics or whether you're trying to find cure for cancer, this is all computation. Okay? So that's, uh, keep in mind that it's computation in the brain and the network of brains. The second thing is, you know, going beyond humans, when you look at nature, uh, in a lot of systems, you know, an important aspect of the system is its capacity for information processing, right? And these systems can be, you know, natural, like physical, chemical, biological, or they can be human-made, like, I don't know, um, linguistics or economics or the internet, uh, right? So, Whenever you're, you know, studying computation in this general sense, whenever you're proving new things, discovering new things about computation, you're really, you know, proving, answering questions about all of these things, right? It's a very general. So this is like really um, getting to the fundamentalness of information and fundament fundamentalness of manipulation of information, which is computation. Okay, so... This is uh, basically computation and computer science uh, um, from a big picture view. So now if we ask, you know, what's the role of theoretical computer science within computer science? Well, hopefully, you know, you'll say that the first thing, the most important thing is to actually come up with the right mathematical model or models for computation, depending on your setting. And then... Explore the logical consequences of the model, create new knowledge, gain insights about computation, understand it better. And then once we have that better understanding, look for interesting applications. And you know, like computer science is extremely fertile with respect to applications, right? And we enjoy uh, many of its applications, uh, when, many of the technologies uh, today. So I showed you some uh, famous uh, theoretical physicists. So I should show you some famous theoretical computer scientists. So here we have Shafi Goldwasser, who was a CMU undergrad. We have Manuel Blum, who was a, who was a CMU professor. We have uh, Avi Wigderson, not related to CMU, so I guess we don't have everybody. But yeah, so here's some uh, famous theoretical computer scientists.
Okay, so now let me draw this picture again for uh, now computer science and theoretical computer science, the same picture that I sh uh, showed you for physics. Now this, the thing that we're interested in studying, the phenomenon, is computation, right? So then we make a mathematical model to understand computation better. Uh, we use logic, uh, rigorous um, reasoning to create new knowledge, and then we come back to the real world thinking about, you know, applications and how we can make use of our new understanding, okay? I should point out, like, this picture is very similar to the picture of physics. On the other hand, there is a actually um, big difference between physics and computer science as fields because physics is like a much more mature and older field compared to computer science. And... Um, that's maybe a bit surprising, right? So why is it that computer science is a relatively new field born uh, only in the 20th century? Well, it turns out it's because the step of going from computation to the mathematical model only happened in the 20th century, so relatively uh, recently. Now, on the one hand, you know, this is surprising because it's not like we haven't been dealing with algorithms and computation for a long time. You know, we've been dealing with them for thousands of years. So here's the multiplication algorithm that you learn in grade school. I don't know the origins of this, but like I would guess it's like thousands of years old. Um, here is Euclid's algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor, right? Thousands of years old. So it seems in that sense that maybe it's surprising um, that, you know, computer science was not, um, uh, did not become a thing until 20th century. On the other hand, maybe it's not too surprising, because if we think about the scientific method, the modern scientific method, you can say maybe it started with Galileo around like 16th, 17th century. And, you know, it makes sense that people, you know, applied this scientific method to things that are like sort of obviously there in your face in some sense, um, right? So you see things falling down and you want to explain why they're falling down and you look at the sky, things are moving around and you want to explain why these things are moving around. And um, it makes sense to like start with these things that are uh, obvious. With respect to computation now, if you think about it, you know, manipulation of information, you know, this is a much more subtle abstract concept, right? Information, what is information? Like we use that word a lot today and we have some intuitive understanding of what that means. But really, if you think about it and try to nail down exactly what you mean by information, it's actually a tricky concept. Um, and so, you know, with respect to computation and formalizing computation, it was harder, I guess, to pinpoint exactly what needs to be, um, you know, formalized. And in some sense, we did not have a need to formalize this concept of computation um, until, you know, some people started asking the right questions. Okay, so formalizing computation is someone, I'm going to say someone had to ask the right question for this to happen. And the thing that led people to ask the right questions, interestingly, is actually... Um, the need for understanding mathematical reasoning more rigorously, right? Trying to put the effort to try to put mathematical reasoning on a more solid foundation was exactly the thing that led people to ask the right questions that led to, um, in some sense, the birth of uh, computer science. So what I'm going to do now is give you a little snapshot uh, from history uh, an important milestone um, that, uh, that led to formalization of computation. The person who asked the right question is David Hilbert, okay? And he's considered to be one of the top mathematicians of all time, top two, top three for sure. And at the time, 1900, he was the top mathematician. And um, in 1900, uh, uh, a conference was organized where all the top mathematicians in the world attended. David Hilbert gave a talk uh, titled The Problems of Mathematics. He presented to the mathematical community 23 open problems that he thought were the most important, interesting open problems. And he thought that these problems should shape the mathematical research in the coming century. Okay, he started his talk 
as follows, and I'll just um, read this to you. Who among us would not be happy to lift the veil behind which is hidden the future, to gaze at the coming developments of our science and at the secrets of its development in the centuries to come? What will be the ends toward which the spirit of future generations of mathematicians will tend? What methods, what new facts will the new century reveal in the vast and rich field of mathematical thought? Okay, so after hearing this, mathematicians were pumped up, uh, ready to tackle the questions. Now, from the perspective of computer science, there are a couple of important uh, problems of Hilbert. The first one is the tenth problem in his list from 1900, and it asks the following. Is there a finite procedure to determine if a given multivariate polynomial with integral coefficients has an integral solution? What does that mean? It means you're given some polynomial like this, okay? So it has, it can have multiple variables like x, y, z. The coefficients are integers. Uh, and you wanna know, can I find integer values to the variables x, y, z so that this equation is satisfied or not? And you want a general procedure, uh, finite procedure, that given any polynomial like this will give you yes or no, whether there is an uh, integral solution or not to the equation. Now, when he, Tilbert is asking a finite procedure, what is he really asking for? Okay, it's like in modern terms, what would we, uh, what, how would we describe this? Yes, exactly. He was asking for an algorithm, right? Um, maybe he didn't have the right word at the time, but um, he wanted an algorithm for this. And this is now in the spirit of mechanizing mathematics in some sense, right? So he wants some algorithm that you could follow mindlessly and uh, be able to answer these kinds of questions in mathematics. Okay. But, you know, it doesn't really get to, uh, you know, the full mechanization of mathematics. The full mechanization of mathematics is a question that he asked like later in 1928. This is called the Entscheidungsproblem. In German, this means the decision problem. And this is now the much more ambitious uh, version of 10th problem. And it says, is there a finite procedure to determine the validity of a given mathematical statement now? Okay, so you might get a statement like this. There exists not x, y, z, n in the natural such that n is greater or equal to 3 and x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. Right, so you'll probably recognize this as, uh, what, what's the statement? You know, anyone see what the statement is? This is Fermat's last theorem, right? Exactly. Very famous theorem, very interesting story behind it. But, you know, Entscheidung's problem is like very general, right? It could be like your input is Riemann hypothesis. It's maybe the twin primes conjecture, Collatz conjecture, Goldbach conjecture, whatever it might be. Um, he wants an algorithm that will tell uh, us whether the statement is like true or false, basically. Okay? So this is full-on asking for mechanization of mathematics. And it's a very interesting question, very actually in some sense maybe philosophical question that is going at the heart of mathematical reasoning and mathematics itself. So very interesting. And people, of course, um, try to answer this question. Now, Hilbert actually believed that the answer would be yes to this question. He believed that there would be an algorithm for this kind of stuff. On the other hand, after, you know, people have, you know, thought about this, it became more clear over time that the answer was not going to be yes. So, and fortunately, I'm going to say the answer turned out to be no. Now, um, why am I saying fortunately? Uh, fortunately, from the perspective of computer science, I guess, because let's say the answer was yes. Well, to prove to you, I guess, that the answer is yes, all I need to do is give you a finite procedure, give you an algorithm, and say, look, this is the algorithm. If you use this algorithm, follow it, you'll get the result you want. And maybe there's like a proof, uh, some kind of a proof that the algorithm is correct. Now, an intuitive understanding what an algorithm is suffices, usually suffices for this task. On the other hand, suppose the answer is no, and it was no, and you want to now prove that it is no. Now you have to rule out any kind of possible algorithm for, solve, for solving this task. And if you think about this, it, this actually forces you to define precisely what an algorithm is. 
because if you're going to rule out any kind of algorithm that might exist, then you have to know exactly what you're talking about, right? So you need a precise definition. And this is what happened, right? So people realize, you know, the answer is going to be no. Well, then you're like, we better like define what we mean by an algorithm if we're going to rule out all possible algorithms. Okay, so now people have done various works on this. Uh, Post, uh, Emil Post in 1920 had some definitions uh, for uh, computation algorithm, but was not confident and not confident enough to even, you know, publish it. Um, Gödel, very famous uh, uh, mathematician, I like myself a bit smaller here, he had um, ideas for some definition, but again, not really confident that he had a good definition, right definition. Church in 1936 invents lambda calculus and claims it should be the definition of an algorithm. Now, Gödel, Post, and other mathematicians did not find Church's claim very convincing or justified. Um, so, you know, yes, he had some uh, um, you know definition, but it was not convincing people. Then, meanwhile, a British grad student, unaware of the debates, was working sort of on the same problem. So this is, of course, Alan Turing, 1936. At the age of 22, he publishes a paper, describes a model of computation called now the Turing machine model. He didn't call it the Turing machine model. We now call it the Turing machine model. And when people saw this, mathematicians at the time, Church, uh, Gödel, you know, they said, okay, he nailed it, game over, algorithm defined. He made a very compelling argument about why his definition uh, was the right uh, definition, was the correct definition. And then only a year later, he actually showed that Turing machines are actually equivalent to uh, lambda calculus. So in fact, Church was also uh, correct in his claim that he had a correct definition. And um, it turns out even, you know, when we now look at Post's work from the 1920s, like it was not published, but like we discover afterwards, that he also had like actually a uh, correct uh, definition. And this is actually not surprising. I mean, we're going to talk about this, but there's a, uh, if you look at computation and if you understand it, the simplicity and the generality of it, some, some you know, universality property of computation uh, means that it's actually not hard to get uh, um, a definition that is correct, okay? So as long as you're not being like too restrictive with your definition, then you're probably going to capture uh, full on uh, generality of computation. And we'll, we'll, I'll talk about that uh, some more. So Turing's contribution here, what he really did was not, you know, that he got a correct definition, but I think uh, the main contribution here is that he got the correct definition that was in some sense the simplest and, and captures all of computation and at the same time was convincing people that it is the right definition. And then once you have that kind of a very convincing, uh, compelling definition, then you can, of course, you know, compare other models to Turing machine model and say, oh, yes, you know, this is equivalent to Turing machine model, then yes, this is also a correct definition. Oh, this happens to be also equivalent to Turing machine model, then that's correct definition as well. <laughs> okay. So um, formalization of computation really happened with the Turing machine model, and we're going to cover this in this course. Now, we can of course, the, the important question of whether the Turing machine model is a correct model or not, you know, the belief that it is the correct model is captured by this thing called the Church-Turing thesis. And informally, basically, it says something like this. The intuitive notion of computable is captured by functions computable by a Turing machine. Um, this is really, you know, thinking at the time, you know, Turing was trying to model like human beings doing calculation uh, with this uh, computing device. So the intuitive notion of computable really refers to, you know, that time, the early 20th century and human computers. On the other hand, I don't actually like or prefer this version of the church Turing thesis because I don't really know what it means, like intuitive notion of computable. It's kind of too vague for my taste. So I prefer actually the following physical uh, Church-Turing thesis, which says that any computational problem that can be solved 
by any kind of physical device only constrained by the laws of physics, okay? And this could be a natural process or like a human-made process. Anything that can be solved in nature um, by any kind of physical process can be solved by a Turing machine, okay? Now, this is a much more precise statement. It's a statement about the universe that we live in. It's a statement about the laws of physics, um, right? It's a statement about the computational capacity of uh, our universe, okay? So it's a much more precise statement that uh, I prefer. And uh, in some sense, a much more, or like a more far-reaching uh, than the original uh, church Turing thesis, okay? Now, with this now, the physical church Turing thesis, um, we have the bridge between the real world and the abstract world, right? So uh, the mathematical model for computation is a Turing machine model. Okay, so now let's come back to Hilbert's problems, the tenth problem and then Scheidung's problem. Now we know that Hilbert was asking for an algorithm and we can say that he's asking for a Turing machine. And in the paper that he defined the Turing machine model, Alan Turing proved that the Entscheidung's problem is not solvable by any algorithm, by any Turing machine, right? And in some sense, you can say, therefore, that computer science was born aware of its limitations, right? Uh, Hilbert's 10th problem uh, took a longer time. It was a more difficult problem, but eventually that was also resolved in the 1970. And the answer was again, no. So it was not a computable, solvable problem. Okay, so now if I come back to this question, right, is computer science related to science? Of course, right? So like computation is a naturally occurring phenomenon and computer science is the science that studies uh, computation in all its forms. Is it related to engineering? Absolutely, right? I mean, in some sense, most of computer science today, you can say, is engineering and on the applications side, um, because it's such a, um, applications-wise, it's very um, uh, fertile. Um, is it related to math? Of course, because the way we study computation, the way we understand uh, computation is through mathematics. Is it related to philosophy? Absolutely, right? Um, some of the deep philosophical questions that you might ask, like, can machines think? Can, what does it mean for a machine to be intelligent? What, uh, what is consciousness, right? All of these things are in the territory, of course, of computation. And in fact, Alan Turing, of course, is considered to be the father of computer science. Um, in some sense, he's also considered to be the father of artificial intelligence because he had, he started thinking about these things, like what does it mean for a machine to be intelligent? How would we test for uh, that? And so on. Okay. All right. So that's uh, computer science. So if you have any questions, let me know now before I go into the next section. But this is like a very high level overview um, of uh, computer science and the role of theoretical computer science within computer science. In the syllabus, you mentioned that the applications for some of the things we study are beyond our wildest dreams. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, I would say something like, you know, the internet, right? You know, the, you know who would have guessed? I mean, I don't know. It's really um, amazing technology, I would say. Um, it's not something that we predict, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, I don't think you would predict like we would have internet and you would have all the information in the world in some sense under your uh, fingertips. That's quite amazing to me, mind blowing. And it's not something that, you know, I would have predicted, um, for example. So let's see, it's going to take me a while to get used to the idea that the word computation describes the real world and not just the abstract world. This is because it seems information is much more clearly defined in the abstract world. Do you agree about the statement of information? Maybe there, three is some, there is some bias due to the way society presents mathematical thinking to us. Yeah, Zach, like, you know, you're getting into really philosophical territory, very interesting territory here, right? So it's really like, you know, I mean, you can ask, like, what is real and what is abstract and what is the divide between these two things? That's not very clear, right? I mean, in some sense, I would, my, my 
uh, point of view here is that, you know, do we really have access, direct access to reality? Or is everything really um, just, you know, we have mental models for everything and, you know, everything is here in our brain. In some sense, you can say like, you know, our brain is a, you know, virtual reality environment that, you know, uh, sort of has some, uh, gives us some reality there. But, you know, is what is really real and, you know, what do we have access to reality or is everything really mental model? And so maybe everything is abstract and everything is mathematical in that sense. This is very interesting philosophical territory. Um, I would love to talk about these stuff, uh, this stuff more. Um, yeah, so if you want to drop by, if you guys want to drop by after lecture and we want to dig deeper into that kind of stuff, that would be great. That would be awesome. So why do we prefer a Turing machine model over lambda calculus if the latter seems so much uh, more elegant? Um, yeah, so as I said, it's um, it's in terms of it's a... So that, first of all, elegance, you know, that's um, uh, subjective, of course. You know, I think some people prefer the Turing machine model like these. In the modern day, some people would prefer to think about Turing machines when, you know, thinking about computation. Um, and some people prefer to think about uh, lambda calculus um, with respect to like the design of programming languages and so on. So they both have their own advantages and I would say and disadvantages. But at that time, what was important is that you can, you want to convince people you have the right model, right? So, and uh, the point is that, you know, we'll see the Turing machine model is exactly doing what it's supposed to be doing. Like the way that Turing thought about this is that he thought, okay, there's a human being doing calculation. They get some instructions to do, I don't know, take integrals or something. So what are they going to do when they do that? And he actually like took that process, which seems impossible to model mathematically, and he somehow find a very nice, elegant, simple model to capture that. And that's exactly what we were in some sense trying to capture to begin with. So it was convincing right away. Like he has a section in his paper and you can read that section if you want. It's I think maybe the last section or towards the, the end of the paper where he makes this very compelling argument why this is a good model that captures what we want to capture. <laughs> And we didn't, at the time, have that for lambda calculus. But now, of course, in hindsight, we see um, the elegance, of course, of lambda calculus as well and how useful it is as well. Okay. Great questions. Okay. So now what I want to do is dive a little deeper into theoretical computer science so you get a better sense of what theoretical computer science does. Um, and so that will be sort of the second section here. Okay, so there are, I would say, two main questions in theoretical computer science. So once you have a mathematical model for computation, I think the, the question that sort of stares at you right away is the computability of problems, right? So you're given a problem, is there an algorithm to solve it? And in fact, the birth of computer science is thanks to uh, questions like this, right? So these this type of question predates um, the birth of computer science and the modeling of computation. And we have seen, like, you know, there are problems, like Entscheidung's problem or they, uh, Hilbert's uh, tenth problem are not computable. And this is an important problem. It's the first thing that you would study naturally. But it turns out that this is not, the, in some sense, the real question or the interesting question. And there are a couple of different reasons for this. For one, most of the questions, most of the problems that uh, we care about are actually computable. Okay. And second, if you do have an uncomputable problem, there is usually a close cousin, a close variation of that problem that is computable. Okay. So really, computability is not the main question. So if computability is not the main question, what do you think is the main question? Any thoughts about what might be the next important question? Efficiency. How to design an algorithm to compute? Is it worth computing? Yeah, these are very interesting questions. But yeah, so going from computability, I think the next step I would say is actually computational complexity of the problem. Is there an efficient algorithm to solve it? Now, efficiency uh, can come in different uh, flavors. 
right? So it can be in terms of time, uh, but it's not the only resource that a computer uses. It could be space or memory usage. It could be randomness, amount of random. So there's this thing called randomized algorithms. Um, you know, they use random bits to do computation. Uh, randomness is not uh, always cheap. So, you know, you might want to you know, minimize ran the number of random bits you use. You can get more fancy, more sophisticated. You can talk about quantum computation or how much quantum entanglement uh, your algorithm might use and so on and so forth. Right, efficiency, uh, computational complexity, think of it as practical computability, right? So if you have an algorithm that, okay, maybe solves your problem, but even for like small inputs, it takes the age of the universe to get an output. Well, okay, you can say it's computable, but like, you know, practically speaking, that's not computable, right? Who cares? I mean, if it's gonna take the age of the universe, uh, from our perspective, that's really uncomputable. So complexity, computational complexity is really practical computability. And that's really now becomes the central question in theoretical computer science, okay? Now, um, when we're talking about computational complexity, there are, two camps, you can say, right? One camp, one side of the thing is, you know, algorithm designers who try to come up, given a problem, who try to come up, you know, with more and more efficient algorithms for the problem. So let's say you have multiplication problem, multiplying two n bit integers. Now your grade school algorithm that you learn is an n squared time, quadratic time algorithm. Now, once you have an algorithm for a problem, that's actually an upper bound, that puts an upper bound on the true complexity of that problem, okay? So now, you know at least you have the n squared time algorithm, um, but it could be the case that there's a better algorithm so that the true complexity could be better than n squared, but at once you have an algorithm of n squared, at least you know it's no worse. The true complexity is no worse than n squared. So that puts an upper bound on n squared. Good. Now, on the other side of the coin, we have complexity theorists who try to prove lower bounds, who try to argue that there's no efficient algorithm. So, for instance, for the multiplication problem, if we could show that no matter what algorithm you use, you need at least n squared time, okay, that would be the dream. Now you have a matching upper bound and a lower bound, and now you've nailed down the exact complexity of the problem. Now, in the case of multiplication, n squared is not the true complexity. It turns out that there are very interesting, very smart algorithms that do much, much better than n squared, and we're gonna actually see that, uh, see one algorithm in this course, okay? So we have these two camps and, you know, for very interesting problems now. You can ask, like, what's the true complexity of these problems? Multiplying two integers, even though that might sound like a simple problem, really it's very important to actually get the fastest algorithm you can for this kind of thing. It's a very primitive operation, right? Many algorithms will use, you know, multiplication, and it's quite possible that in your algorithm, the bottleneck is multiplying two large numbers. So you wanna make sure that you do this kind of thing as fast as you can. You know, practically, that's very important. Um, now, on the other side, you know, the opposite of, in some sense, multiplication might be the factoring, right? So now I give you an integer and I want you to find the prime factors of that integer, right? Now, this is a very interesting problem because we do not know of an efficient algorithm for this problem. And in fact, there are certain situations where we want actually to have hard problems, computationally hard problems, because we can make use of the computational hardness of problems in applications. And factoring is a very uh, important example of this. Like for example, in cryptography, whenever you're sending information, you know, secure information on the internet, you know, whenever you type HTTPS, S stands for secure, there's some cryptographic protocol going on in the background, and the security of these protocols actually rely on the computational assumption that the factoring problem is computationally a hard problem, right? So, uh, so it's not like we always want to find better and better efficient algorithms. Sometimes we want uh, problems to be hard so that we can uh, exploit that hardness in applications. Then there are other, you know, um, uh, very important problems coming from all sorts of areas, disciplines, detecting communities and social networks, 
protein structure prediction, simulation of quantum systems, computing Nash equilibrium of games. There are problems that we would love to solve efficiently. And if there was an efficient solution for these problems, they would like completely revolutionize uh, very important fields, um, major applications in medicine, in economics, um, in, in nanotechnology and so on, right? So um, complexity of problems uh, is very important and can have very uh, important applications. Now, on the other hand, I don't want to give you the impression that in theoretical computer science, you know, we have a laundry list of like all these problems and we go through them one by one and try to nail down, try to figure out the exact complexity of these problems. We do look at more general questions, more meta questions. Um, and um, one of the you know famous ones here is the P versus MP problem, which I'm sure you've heard about. Right. So this is, in some sense, um, you can say like the most important open problem in computer science, one of the most important open problems in all of mathematics. It is one of the uh, seven uh, prize problems from the Clay Math, Math Institute, Millennium Problems. So these seven problems were published by the Clay Math Institute in the year 2000, at the turn of the century. And this is in the same spirit of like David Hilbert presenting to the world 23 open problems at the turn of the century to say like these problems should, um, you know, direct mathematical research. The same thing here at year 2000, here are the most important open problems in mathematics. And there's one problem that is um, a computer science problem in this uh, list, and that's the P versus MP problem. And it's at the uh, the, the the character of this problem is that you know we're trying to understand the divide between efficiently computable and not efficiently computable, right? So this is a really a question about what kind of problems can we compute efficiently and what kind of problems we cannot compute uh, efficiently, and uh, in some sense you can say. Uh, by the way, these all of them have a million dollar price tag, right? So if you solve any of these problems, you get a million dollar uh, award. On the other hand, I would say that the million pro dollar price tag doesn't do justice to the importance of these problems, right? So it's kind of undervalues them, but you know, there's that. You can say that the P versus MP problem in some sense, maybe the most important problem here, because if the P versus MP problem answer to that question turns out a certain way, such that there are actually efficient solutions, efficient algorithms for these NP problems, um, then that actually might very well mean that we can use that algorithm to solve all these other mathematical conjectures because doing mathematics, finding mathematical proofs is computation, right? So, and if you, if MP problems are easy, it turns out that we can actually uh, solve, uh, hopefully solve uh, those mathematical conjectures as well. And so you no, don't collect just $1 million, you collect $7 million, so you kill, you know, seven birds with one stone. Although, that's not quite true, because one of these conjectures is actually solved. It's the Poincaré conjecture was solved by the Russian mathematician Perelman. Interesting story there, he actually declined the $1 million prize. He was awarded the um, Fields Medal, which is like the top award in mathematics. It's kind of like the Nobel Prize in math. He declined that award as well. So his basically, um, you know, position was that he did not feel that it was right that he got all or most of the credit for this. He thought that, you know, there was important work done before him and it was maybe not right for him uh, to actually get, um, you know, most of the credit, right? Quite a legend. Um, and yeah, you can read about that more if you like, but, you know, there's an interesting story there. Okay, now what else? Um, you know, physicists love to study time and space and the relationship between time and space. Computer scientists also, we like to study time and space and understand the relationship between time and space as resources for computation. Uh, here's like one uh, interesting question uh, that we can ask about time and space. If I have a solution to a problem that's space efficient, that doesn't use too much space, does that mean that I can also find a time efficient solution for that same uh, problem? 
Now, when you think about time and space as resources, you quickly see like there's a fundamental difference between time and space. With space, you can reuse it, right? And in your computation, you have some amount of space, you can reuse that space as you're doing your computation. With time, well, we don't think you can reuse time, right? Unless you can back, go back in time. Um, and actually, like, I mean, you can come up with computational models that allow you to go back in time. Uh, and that's very interesting, and they're interesting results, actually, uh, for those kinds of computational models. But, you know, our, we're going to keep things simple. You know, for us, you know, computation and our computational model, we're not going to be able to go back in time. And uh, so there's a fundamental difference between space and time in terms of resources. So it seems like the, the answer to this question, you know, if we have a space-efficient solution, do we always get a time-efficient solution? It seems the answer should be no. But we actually don't know how to actually answer this kind of very basic question. Okay. Determinism versus randomization is also a very interesting uh, question in um, theoretical computer science. So we talked about that, you know, there are randomized algorithms. So the question is, are there problems that I would be able to solve efficiently uh, with a randomized algorithm? Okay, and maybe I cannot solve it efficiently with a deterministic algorithm. Now, it might sound surprising maybe at first that randomization would help at all with computation. But on the other hand, like think about polling, right? Or random sampling. Random sampling is a very powerful, actually, um, tool. So, um, so yeah, it's not uh, immediately clear where their randomization might help or not. And this is a very, actually, important, big, open problem in uh, theoretical computer science, understanding truly, like, how, what randomization buys you. Okay. Um, how about cryptography and security, right? So, very important subfield of uh, theoretical computer science. And you can say that... Um, Computational complexity has completely revolutionized cryptography. So cryptography, of course, is around for thousands of years. It predates um, computation uh, and computer science itself. Uh, but once we realized that we can exploit, um, once we realized that we can exploit the computational hardness of problems in cryptography, a whole new world opened up in some sense, a whole new set of applications that we never thought, like intuitively, when you look at some of the things that we can do in cryptography, intuitively, if I describe to you, you would say, and there's no way you can do that. But actually, it turns out we can uh, do it um, uh, thanks to computational complexity considerations. Okay, so we'll see example of that. Now, going more into the like application side of things, you know, socioeconomics, um, suppose you have, you know, some number of goods that you want to divide among some number of players. Um, how can you find an efficient algorithm that is fair? How do you define fairness? Can you do it in a way that's privacy preserving? How do you define privacy? You know, all of these things are uh, at uh, uh, within the realm of theoretical computer science. Uh, we can look at the intersection of economics and computer science. There's a nice field, algorithmic game theory, uh, which kind of like you could say was born, um, you know, with the internet and the econ trying to understand the economy of the internet is in some sense a big motivation for uh, algorithmic game theory. And very interesting area. Um, learning theory, right? So you know that machine learning is quite a hot topic uh, these days. And, you know, we have these amazing machine learning algorithms that do amazing things like deep neural networks and so on. Uh, on the other hand, you know, a lot of the time, these algorithms are like a black box. We don't really understand how they work. Um, and that's not good, that's not desirable. What we would really hope to do here is find a nice a mathematical foundation, a mathematical understanding of, let's say, neural networks, deep neural networks, so that we can prove properties about them. So we know, like, if there is bias in the algorithm, um, you know, we can detect or we can prove that there's bias or not and things like that. Um, and then there's quantum computation. 
uh, which is absolutely fascinating area, right? So a lot of the time, most of the time, you know, we're going to be talking about, of course, classical computation. Uh, you know, information is represented with bits, zeros, and ones, and how they are, uh, how they evolve, how they transform, follows classical laws of physics. But there it turns out, if you look at the tiny particles like electrons and photons and how they behave, their behavior is completely different, very unintuitive, very surprising. And now the question is, can we exploit the weird behavior of these tiny particles like electrons and photons to maybe solve some problems computationally faster than we would be able to do with a classical computer, right? So this is now really, you know, trying to harness the real computational capacity of the universe, right? So that's like really quantum computation and it's absolutely a fascinating area. And turns out, for example, um, maybe you know about this already. I told you that in cryptography, we, you know, in the protocols that we use on the internet today, we rely on the assumption that the factoring problem is computationally hard. Turns out com quantum computers can solve the factoring problem efficiently, all right? So if we one day hopefully build quantum computers, we won't be able to use those cryptographic systems that we currently use on the internet today. We need new systems that are secure against quantum computation as well. So very interesting, fascinating area. And of course, I can go on and on and on, but I think this gives you hopefully a good big picture view.